I am very excited to introduce Brian. I have no doubt that he will, within one minute of presenting, he will be the best forester analyst to ever have presented at the CTI Summit, as I set such a low bar for you <laughs> in the past, Brian. Um, one of the things I think about from last year at the summit, uh, towards the end of the day, we kind of just had people were standing up talking about ideas, you know, some of the, the fun stuff we were uh, wrap, wrap up session and we were talking about this year, we wanted to see more talks. We thought there's a gap in our content around intelligence requirements, collection management, collection plans and things like that. And we have a lot of great talks in this area, but Brian's got a, a nice angle on it and he's working in design thinking, which I wasn't actually that familiar with design thinking until uh, Brian mentioned to me, you know, many, many months ago before he even had a talk uh, here for this. And then I got to work with Brian on his content. So it's been a pleasure to work with Brian. I'm, I'm excited for him to share his uh, content. So Brian, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, uh, Katie, Rick, for that introduction. Uh, let's see, do I have control now here? There we go. All right. So thank you for joining me here. Thank you for staying on after Chris Krebs wonderful keynote and shout out to him. I'm coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia today. I love that he acknowledged the hard work that the uh, Georgia elections officials did to uh, secure our infrastructure here. That was just amazing. Um, and if you joined this track, hoping you wouldn't get to have to talk about waves, um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but we will actually talk a little bit about the Forester Wave for Threat Intelligence Services. I've learned so much throughout that process from the vendors, from our customer references, and a big part of this presentation is actually taking those uh, anecdotes and those fragments that were left on kind of the production floor and uh, sharing them with you to talk about how we can, you know, better elicit intelligence requirements. So obviously we have to do the appeal to authority. I have 18 plus years of combined active and reserve service. Most of that as a military intelligence officer. I did two threat intelligence roles at SecureWorks. I also did threat intelligence at a very large critical infrastructure asset owner operator. A few college degrees along the way, including the SANS one and a whole bunch of security certifications. I'm a practitioner. I've been at many, many SANS CTI summits. I love this event. Um, and now I'm in this role where I get to kind of have this macro view and I get to pause my uh, like kind of operational role and really think about improving the cyber threat intelligence field. So super excited here. Let's talk about the history at this event of talking about intelligence requirements. We have to talk about the current practices that people use to elicit their intelligence requirements definitely need to show a few examples of bad requirements. And then I wanna show you what good looks like. Then we will actually walk through design thinking and I'll take you through an example of one persona and how we would use that process to elicit good intelligence requirements. And then I'm gonna leave you with an action plan so that you can take back immediately to your, uh, to your organizations, whether you're a vendor or you're an end user and improve your ability to answer your, uh, your stakeholders requirements. Three years ago at this event, Mike Ray talked about how planning was so important that, that we really can't effectively complete the intelligence cycle. We can't produce good intelligence that helps our stakeholders manage cyber risk without this step, without intel good intelligence requirements. And last year, Chris Cochran, who's doing his uh, workshop right now, debuted his easy method, sort of an alternate intelligence cycle. The E in easy, of course, is elicit intelligence requirements. And at the end, he did show a spreadsheet that was a list of, of intelligence requirements. But what we didn't talk about in any of these other presentations was like, how do we get from A to B? And that's one thing that I hope to uh, do for you today is give you a, an alternative. Uh, and, and of course, last year during Rob's keynote, you know, unfortunately, we were just not good at this. So there's a need for us to come up with some better methods to elicit intelligence requirements. One of the great quotes that I got through the wave process, uh, this particular intelligence director, you know, struggled to identify stakeholders. They tried to create some method to work with those stakeholders to meet their needs. And 
that was all extremely hard for them to operationalize. These are real challenges that intelligence teams of all sizes are facing. That was pretty apparent to me through the process. So current practices uh, that, we, that we do security, that we do threat intelligence from, uh, hashtag YOLOSEC. If you're familiar with Kelly Shortridge, she has popularized this term. I definitely encourage you to check out her Twitter feed and her blog. Uh, she writes about this concept uh, pretty frequently. This is kind of the, you know, sticking your head in the sand. Maybe it's the, like the thoughts and the prayers of security and threat intelligence. So, you know, I, I, I come from the place maybe where I, I don't think my organization is a target. What, what information do we have of value? Why do I need to spend resources on this? And um, did I just go backwards? There we go. Uh, back on track here. So, you know, without intelligence requirements, you know, how do we really do security? Well, we're just kind of randomly throwing resources at, um, at different problems, and we really haven't aligned those with our threat landscape. At the opposite end of the spectrum, Kelly also writes about this, is FOMO sec, fear of missing out. And this is like the security strategy that is led by marketing and keeping up with the Joneses. So buying all the latest and greatest technology, going to RSA conference, walking the vendor floor, and just kind of like, you know, making it rain with your company's security budget. L labeling all the XDRs, MDRs, MSSPs, CASBs, SASEs, and all, all the different acronyms and just stacking everything on there. And when it comes to threat intelligence, I've seen a few end users that, that kind of have this FOMO method where they go and acquire every IOC in the world, everything, they scrape Twitter and they see drunk binary tweeting out hashes and they, they go to the spam houses and the abuse.ch uh, list and they, they buy all the feeds and, and they just throw those into the SIM. They, they throw it into their security tools and they blow up the, the sock uh, with a bunch of low value, useless alerts. But the, the, the fear is that there's that one feed somewhere on the planet that has that one IP address, that one domain that prevents the breach. And, and while you know, I, I understand that, like that's, that's still not a good strategy. That in itself is not a good intelligence requirement. And, you know, you know, like I said, you know, we just collect everything and without a strategy, it, it leads to suboptimal out, outputs. And, and really it's often not collecting all the internal telemetry. It's usually ends up being just collect everything outside the network. All right, so kind of two no methods there. Now kind of meeting in the middle, brainstorming. And brainstorming, you know, it's something we all tend to do. Uh, but when we brainstorm, we, we tend to not include our stakeholders in that. And we tend to invite people to the brainstorming session that we're, we're familiar with. And we don't think very creatively when we are sitting there looking at, at people that we're already familiar with. Uh, and then you get times like this guy here on the left who's just staring down at his phone, probably, you know, talking smack on Twitter or something uh, instead of contributing the conversation. So, you know, brainstorming, you know, can be great. But, you know, like Mike Ray also said uh, three years ago that, um, you know, we all try to be like SpongeBob, but, you know, it doesn't really work, unfortunately. So we, we need a process uh, to, to elicit our intelligence requirements. And, you know, the, the U.S. and the U.K. Army have been using this process called intelligence preparation of the battlefield for like for like generations. Right. And so also three years ago at this event, uh, Rob Dartnall, who is a U.K. Army officer, he's like, you know, my brother from another mother or something like that. You know, he presented uh, intelligence preparation of the cyber environment, which is just a adaptation of intel prep of the battlefield for our you know, cybersecurity role. Uh, Four-step process sounds really easy, and it works great on a battlefield. But when when we do it here, it's it's not the best. So, first at the top of, of that uh, graphic, there we define the operational environment. We have to understand where we are in the world, both physically and logically. 
And then we describe all of our influences on the environment, things like vulnerabilities, security culture policies, regulatory environments, the compliance regimes and so forth. Then we model the threat actors. And on a traditional battlefield, I probably am gonna model one, maybe two threats. And, and, and that's all. But here we're doing hundreds, thousands maybe of threats. And, that's, and now this process doesn't uh, start to scale very well. And we take all the products from steps one through three and we layer them all on top of each other. And we come up with multiple threat scenarios. Typically we come up with two threat scenarios, a most likely scenario and a most damaging scenario. So now you see where the scale problem just increases even more. And, and, and this, it's, it's untenable there. Now, normally uh, what happens is when we lay those scenarios together on a real battlefield, we, we find opportunities in time and space to detect which scenario our threat, our enemy has chosen. And that is our initial intelligence requirements because answering that question helps our unit make a better decision so that we can achieve our mission without introducing more risk than is necessary to achieve that mission. And, and the scaling just doesn't work very well. You know, I, I came from the same perspective that Rob Dartnell did. I wrote a SANS paper about this. It's in the SANS reading room. You know, I tried to make this work and I realized like doesn't scale very well. I tried doing it at the old job. It was tough. I mean, I, I basically did it for the whole two and a half years that I was at my last job and I could never really get it to a, a level that I felt was complete enough. Uh, to really drive everything else, to drive the requirements, to drive the collection plan. Super challenging. And, uh, but I am encouraged, actually, one of the vendors in the threat intelligence wave actually does use this process during their customer onboarding. And I was, I'm really encouraged by it. I love it. I love that there's an attempt. I love that we're using some process. Uh, and it takes them about 30 days to go through that. And that's, that's one twelfth of your, your annual contract with that vendor, which is a long time before you're, you're really achieving value from that. So, um, and, and my suspicion also is that that vendor cannot do this process at a uh, thorough and complete enough level to really be effective as a internal team could do it. So moving on. Let's talk about some bad and good intelligence requirements first. So some other things that I heard during this process when I was interviewing customers of these vendors was we need info from the dark web. Dark web's a marketing term. It's not an intelligence requirement. You know, what are you, what crown jewels are you trying to protect? What decisions are you trying to make? Just Simply finding your brand name in the dark web doesn't really mean that you have a threat. It doesn't really, and, and what decision can you make just by finding your, your name somewhere? Uh, so we need to do better educating our clients. Things that, additional things that are not intelligence requirements are like your domain names, brand names, and your IP ranges. I saw Tor exit nodes on a list of intelligence requirements, executive names, and phone numbers like, these aren't intelligence requirements. They may be things that you tune. These are actually a lot of things that you would uh, enumerate during step two of Intel prep of the cyber environment, but they, they aren't intelligence requirements. All right, moving on to what good looks like. Okay, so a good intelligence requirement is an enduring question that some intelligence stakeholder has. It's a question where the answer helps that stakeholder make a risk-based decision. So where do I allocate my resources? How do I tune my security controls to reduce risk? Which vulnerabilities do I patch first? Those are the types of questions our stakeholders tend to ask. So going from a pretty simple uh, example of a good requirement, we'll build this out to a much more challenging intelligence requirement. So my first example for you here today, what infrastructure is being used to socially engineer our 
customers. If I identify phishing web pages, domains that are mimicking my brand, I can sync all them at my environment. I can work with the browsers. I can work with the infrastructure providers to block and categorize that infrastructure so that I can reduce the risk to my customers of getting phished. Second example here, what exploits are likely to be used against my organization? If I identify exploits and I map that to the different hardware and software that I use, now I know where I should prioritize my remediation. So I can work with those asset owners, application owners, the network uh, engineers and so forth, put controls into place to reduce the risk of exploitation. Third example here, what infrastructure has a known threat group built that is likely to be used in a campaign against us? So we know that threats do things repeatedly. They, they have a pattern of building infrastructure and we can identify that sometimes even before that infrastructure becomes operational. And when we find that we can sync all it, we can report it, we can share that information with peers and law enforcement and ISACs and so forth with our, with our vendors and we can help protect you know, the whole community. And lastly, what tactics, techniques, and procedures are likely to be used by threat actors to compromise or attack our crown jewels? If we determine these TTPs, that leads to our security strategy. That's, that's where we put our finite security resources. So coming from critical infrastructure or a big electric utility, uh, transmission is huge, the bulk electric system there. So, you know, a big focus of mine was understanding the TTPs that threats may use against the bulk electric system and advising our transmission business unit about how to reduce risk to the, uh, from those threats. Well, there's at least one guy that wants to know how we go about eliciting uh, better intelligence requirements. So, so let's move on and let's start talking about design thinking. Design thinking is this iterative process of building products that places the stakeholder at the center. So we, we empathize we, with that stakeholder. We, we understand their point of view. We redefine the problem or the need based on that empathy. Then we brainstorm. Then we build our crude prototypes and then we test those things. And then the cycle goes over and we iterate through each step and we iterate throughout the whole process over and over again, incrementally improving our products. So we have to start with some motivation. And, and I heard several motivations during the wave customer reference calls. Some uh, customers said, we needed to get a complete picture of the threat, la threat landscape. Awesome, very proactive, great. Sometimes they had a big incident and that was what motivated them to build an intelligence capability. And my apologies to my colleagues that are presenting in the other track from Target, but that event was still a watershed moment for many people in InfoSec. And that's when a lot of people started building intelligence capabilities. And ultimately what we're trying to do, what the boards of directors are concerned with is protecting the brand. So now we have a motivation, we need to start empathizing with our intelligence stakeholders. Understanding their point of view is so important to getting this right, to adding value and not just being a bottleneck or wasting resources. Empathy, in my opinion, is a force multiplier in threat intelligence. We're all, we have to be all about our stakeholder, our customer. That's what we're trying to do. We don't, we don't build a security architecture. We don't answer all the alerts. We don't do the incident response. We're here to enumerate the threats and assess them and model them and advise our stakeholders on how best to prepare for those threats to, to be forward looking. So we, we have to identify our stakeholders and here's a, a stakeholder analysis worksheet that helps us identify and enumerate the characteristics about our different stakeholders. So starting there on the left, we have our stakeholders and, and I used titles here, but I gave them a persona type name. Uh, 
these stakeholders are, are real people. They're not just a title. Uh, not all CISOs are identical. They're not carbon copies of themselves. They have, they work for different organizations. They have different personalities, priorities change and so forth there. So your stakeholders are real people. Keep that in mind. Understanding whether the internal or external to your organization is important. The, the importance of the stakeholder is, is super important to understand. Not all stakeholders are created equal. Some are definitely gonna be more important than others. The level of support that that stakeholder has for threat intelligence is important. And that hopefully that level of support changes and increases as you deliver value to them. Every one of those stakeholders will have different issues and a different mindset. And, and what constitutes a win for them will be different. And then we need a strategy for influencing them. Some stakeholders are very skeptical of the value of what we do, so it may be a long process. Some stakeholders may already understand the value that we can bring to the team and will offer you a lot of support. So once we've identified these stakeholders, now we need to go and build that empathy and we can send surveys. A lot of the vendors will send surveys out about requirements, um, but I think we need to have more conversations. We need, to, we need to empathetically listen to to these stakeholders. So this little empathy map here, starting on the left, these are observations during a, a stakeholder meeting. Things that the stakeholder says, things they do, uh, things they do like, do they lean forward or lean back? Does the inflection in their voice change when they say certain things? Do they look away? Are they distracted by their phone? That helps us enumerate all those different things in the stakeholder analysis worksheet. And then on the right side are inferences that we make from that conversation. What we think the stakeholder is thinking, how they feel, and then we derive some needs and insights from this conversation. So let's build this out. I'm using our SOC manager, Steve Martin, as the example here. And he may say things like he struggles with turnover and knowledge retention, knowledge management, false positives, uh, OSINT, things that pretty much all SOC managers are gonna say, right? And during that conversation, maybe we notice that he shifts a little bit around SOC analyst burnout uh, and, and make some other nonverbal cues that we pick up on there. So we can infer that our SOC manager is thinking about the signal to noise ratio is suboptimal. Uh, he, he would love his SOC analyst to have more time assessing, you know, single alerts and, and dealing with, with higher, uh, more important alerts rather than chasing down all these false positives and things. And in general, that SOC manager probably thinks that threat intelligence hasn't really been helping the SOC. So, SOC needs better and quicker access to high quality intelligence. They need to improve signal to noise ratio, reduce burnout. And some insights we can gather now is that those things lead to reduced SOC effectiveness and, and growth in the Security Operations Center. So building on that empathy map from our SOC manager, let's redefine that particular persona's, that, that particular stakeholders um, actual need here. So we build out our stakeholder, the needs, the insights, and an emotion. So our security operations center needs threat intelligence to provide high quality tactical intelligence to improve the signal to noise ratio and situational awareness because burnout and high false positive rates lead to turnover and improperly triaged alerts. And all this makes them feel like CTI isn't working for them. Awesome. Now we can start actually building out our list of intelligence requirements. This is where we now get to brainstorm finally. So we've put in a lot of work before we get to this point and it's gonna pay off here. So now we, we throw those sticky notes up on the wall or we get the whiteboard out and we, we start coming up with some different ways that we can help. So CTI can become that threat library of all the threat activity that we see inside the network that we can observe amongst our peers that we can gather from threat intelligence vendors. We can help filter out a lot of the widespread commodity events that just pollute the SOC channel. We can give them better sources for them to 
help to help them better understand infrastructure and tools that they're observing on the network. And now it's time to prototype. So remember the prototypes, it's fine to start crude. We're gonna iterate on these and we're gonna make them better. So here's a first prototype of, uh, of a list of intelligence requirements for Steve Martin. Uh, we, we take some elements of that stakeholder worksheet. We kind of assign a PIR number. We kind of have a crude PIR. We come back to the stakeholder. Hey, you know, is this good? Is this what you're looking for? And then you know, we come back, we, we improve the prototyping, you know, we, we throw a column over here that, hey, are we able to answer this right now? Yes, no, partially, that helps get us into that collection plan. And all these things build on each other. And then, and then we need to test. So th this is where metrics come in and we kind of suck at intelligence metrics, uh, but we do have a few things with this example that we can look at. We can analyze our signal to noise ratio before and after we started this new project. We can look at the number of false positives that our shock analysts are dealing with. Ideally, we see these metrics improving. And because we're all about empathy with design thinking, continue to talk to your stakeholders, listen to what they're saying, observe what they're doing, make those inferences and keep iterating on those lists of intelligence requirements. And if you don't uh, believe that design thinking is valuable, Forrester has tons of data. We have a recent uh, design thinking scenario model that some of our product manager researchers did. And, and this is some real wonderful ROI on design thinking. Um, it's a real great framework for building better things. And, and, and I think it can be adapted to eliciting intelligence requirements and be very effective at helping us do our jobs a little bit better. All right, so I told you I'm gonna leave you with an action plan. But wait, <laughs> there is more. So when we talk about planning and direction, we almost always talk about requirements and requirements are huge and, and a very big portion of this step of the intelligence cycle. But don't forget, there is the collection plan. Once we elicit those intelligence requirements, we need to plan on how to answer them. So we, we develop indicators for every single one of these requirements. We determine very specific types of questions, and then we link those to some kind of intelligence source. It could be forums in your underground communities. It could be passive DNS, uh, could be your, your who is data, uh, malware analysis, sandboxes, and so forth there. RFIs are a, a type of intelligence requirement and properly scoping those down and aligning those to our sources, also very big portion of planning and direction. And lastly, the intelligence architecture. This is something that I think we fail at a little bit too. We have to connect all these things, all these data sources and get them into a place where, anal where analysts can do analysis. We need to automate out a lot of the just moving of data around. It's just a, it's something that robots and scripts can do perfectly fine and, and leave us to the things that only human analysts with our experience and our knowledge can do. So that action plan. For you, I want you to start with two to three stakeholders. Don't, don't try to boil the ocean. Start with a couple of the obvious stakeholders, SOC manager, CISO, so forth and ask them, who else should I speak to? Ha help have them help build out your network of stakeholders. You do well for the first couple, they'll start telling everybody else how well you have done for them and, and they'll expand your network of stakeholders and keep iterating. Throughout the empathy, the ideation, everything, the prototyping, testing, keep iterating, keep making incremental improvements to your uh, list of intelligence requirements, to your collection plan, to your knowledge of, of your stakeholders, to understanding their point of view. And for me, I'm gonna continue doing research in this. Uh, shortly after I conclude, I'm gonna drop a survey in the Slack uh, and, and it's gonna help me do some research and refine some of the 
um, insights from, from all this research that we do at Forrester. And my goal for this is to eventually open source a, maybe an Excel workbook or some other tool uh, to get you a substantial part of the way there through this process to give you a stakeholder analysis worksheet, empathy maps, uh, a template for a list of intelligence work requirements. So uh, big things coming hopefully on this front and again, Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Rick, for, for having me and, and the rest of the SANS team. Um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the summit. And you can find me in the Slack soon. <laughs>